We are the family and the community that makes Walmart, Walmart. Whether it's stepping up in times of need, or standing with our customers in times of calm and celebration, delivering on our promise to help them save money and live better every day. We are Walmart. My name is Carrie Johnson. I cover justice for NPR. I read this site almost every day. And on days when I don't read it, I'm sorry I didn't. Um, first, I want to congratulate these gentlemen for their eight year anniversary on this website, which is hard to believe. September 2010, they founded this thing. And as uh, per the founding document, they wanted to chronicle the nebulous zone where actions taken to protect the nation interact with the nation's laws and legal institutions. So things have changed a lot in the last eight years. What did you start out wanting to be before we talk about how things have changed? Well, the, the original conception of Lawfare was, first of all, not as a news site, not as a uh, broader commentary institution. It was very much a sort of blog of three friends. And the observation that gave rise to it was that the uh, debate over national security legal issues, which back in those naive days we understood to be external facing questions like what can you and can't you do to terrorists? Uh, how do you, what level of confidence do you need to have that somebody is a terrorist before you can do those things? What sort of surveillance authorities should the government have? You know, remember that world where that, those were the things we were concerned about. Um, and those, we felt that those questions were being debated too much in a uh, kind of dialogue of the deaf between the government's litigating positions and a kind of uh, human rights, civil liberties orthodoxy of, that was prevalent in, among interest groups uh, and litigators who were challenging government policies. And that there was sort of an insufficient attention to the question of, hey, there are a lot of people in government who have really hard decisions to make and are struggling with really interesting and difficult legal questions. What if we think about those people as the audience rather than the sort of subject for either praise or denunciation? What if you imagined a, a dialogue that was really with those people? And uh, so the site started very much because Bobby and I had written a, a very lengthy uh, kind of treatise on uh, the Guantanamo habeas cases. And Jack and Bobby had done a lot of writing together. And Jack and I had done a lot of writing together. And we kind of felt that there was a sort of joint sensibility there that was just not sort of part of the public conversation. And so we kind of, in a very uh, bloggy kind of way, decided, OK, well, we can kind of make it part of the conversation by turning this outward a little bit. Uh, and I think I worked on Jack Goldsmith for probably eight or 10 months to get him to agree to start this site. And we, um, he hemmed and hawed about it. Jack is not always the most decisive uh, person in the world. And he um, one day called me from Hawaii. He was in a hotel uh, at the Ninth Circuit Judicial Conference. And he had just heard Justice Kennedy, who was the circuit justice for the Ninth Circuit, give a speech. And Justice Kennedy had said that he used to, his clerks used to read law review articles, but now they only read the Volokh conspiracy. Uh, which was you know was then as now a prominent legal blog and Jack just called me from the floor of the hotel he's like okay you win I'm in so it took 10 months to convince Jack to do it and it took one phone call to convince Bobby to do it because Bobby uh, I had which, nothing better to do <laughs> <laughs> but uh, in in an important respect Bobby had something else than nothing better to do which is he had this listserv which was in some ways the early uh, proto lawfare was this uh, little listserv that Bobby ran that everybody had to be on in order to know 
what was useful and what was happening in the world of national security law. And that was, a, I think, an important, uh, Bobby will speak for himself, but I think that was an important indicator early on to Bobby that, that there was an audience for the kind of work we were thinking about doing. That's interesting. I hadn't thought about the listserv in a while, except recently when I sent a message out to it, a, a rare message to it, saying, guys, I'm, this, that's it. We're kind of done. And it's been sort of dead and just hadn't been declared so for a long time. But on that listserv, which had been around maybe at that point five or six years and had you know, many thousands of people on it, it was a mix of academics, journalists, uh, interested people who'd heard about it, um, but also a lot of uh, JAGs, a lot of uh, F FBI and intelligence, NGOs, uh, a lot of, you know, just everybody was on there. And it was a one-way listserv, like a blog, with no comment section, where nobody was able to communicate to each other using the listserv. But they could write back to me, and I would, I would put out a, sh a short notice that there's this new case, Ninth Circuit holds the hey, Congress has passed another NDAA, it's got this section in it you should all look at. And then I'd get a little bounce back from, you know, every time a few dozen people. And it would be people from all over the ideological and political spectrum. And I just loved that, being a sort of a wishy-washy, middle-of-the-road kind of guy. That, that, was, that was definitely my sensibility. And what I heard most often was that people really appreciated getting something that didn't feel like it came with a sharp spin on it already. And it was really just kind of conveying the news. And I've never fancied myself a journalist like you, Carrie, but, but I, I, I think there's something very noble in trying to do that. Um, and so I enjoyed that greatly. And what, what always has appealed to me so much about lawfare is that from the beginning, I, I think one of the defining uh, sensibility features is that it's we at least aspire to be relentlessly nonpartisan. And this is not a Republican blog. It's not a Democratic blog. There, there are people who vote for all sorts of different candidates for different reasons that are all regular contributors. Um, and ideologically, we span a relatively uh, broad spectrum as well. But what we all have in common is uh, a real serious commitment to things I identify as civic virtue, to reasoned argument, to not personalizing your policy and political differences the greatest extent possible. We're all people and we all kind of succumb to it here and there. But I think one reason why the blog was so successful in an environment where there were other people talking about these things is that it seemed proof uh, at a time that increasingly needed the proof that people who disagree could still have an intelligent discussion of issues that matter to all of us. Um, and it seemed that way back then. Now, and to, to borrow from the Lawfare coin, it's an oasis to some extent. An oasis with an audience or parts of an audience that you never imagined, both in terms of size and composition, right? Right. I, and so it's worth thinking about it as multiple audiences, right? So there's the core audience uh, from the, the sort of original audience of the site, which is, broadly speaking, an extension of Bobby's listserv, right? It, it's, it's an audience composed, I think, almost entirely of practicing national security lawyers uh, across all the agencies that have them, uh, congressional staff, uh, courts, judges, clerks uh, who work these cases, outside lawyers who work these cases, journalists and academics. And that was the core audience of Lawfare. And we had sort of slow, steady growth as we went from you know, the original to essentially 100% penetration of that audience. And then um, about two and a half years ago, as the Trump phenomenon began to percolate, um, we suddenly saw this very explosive growth. And that was of a, a completely different audience of lay people who were alarmed by the politics of the country and who saw in this site a group of people who they uh, looked to for guidance about how to think about what was happening. And so one of the real challenges, and, and that audience, unlike the original audience, is huge. Um, so we had 11 and a half million people on the site last year and will do about the same this year. And that's, you know, 400% the size of the previous, uh, of 2015 uh, or 16, which is itself 
probably 70% higher than 2015. And so we've had this sort of sudden exponential growth almost entirely among people who are uh, not legally trained who do, and who are not formally trained in national security work of any kind. And so that has created, a, like a, I think, a remarkable editorial challenge, which is how do you stay true to the original audience? How do you con con continue to serve the original audience, which wants documents, which wants uh, pretty granular technical analyses of things that happen, while also serving this vast new audience who wants to understand what FISA is and how and what Devin Nunes is talking about when he talks about you know the Carter Page FISA and the deep state conspiracy and you know the Steele dossier right uh, and so it's a it's actually a very profound challenge that I think we've all sort of struggled with. Well, in fact, uh, one of your more famous consumers actually tweeted you, but seemed to have missed the point. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, so yeah, that would be an example of somebody who did not, I think, read the article in question. Uh, and I think this is what happens when you uh, get uh, your lawfare uh, diet through uh, Morning the, Joe. the medium of Morning Joe. Morning Joe. Um, and to be We're talking, of course, about the president. Yeah, to be fair to to be fair to Morning Joe, uh, Joe Scarborough did an excellent job describing what was in that article, and the president heard what he wanted to hear in what Scarborough said, and tweeted out, that was a weird morning. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and I was, um, you know, a, a presidential tweet is uh, an event that does cause your phone to explode. And I was in an Uber when it happened, and I, um, all of a sudden, I, it must have been a thousand Twitter mentions in 10 seconds. And um, I, I had no idea what it was about. And I looked at the tweet, and it said lawfare, colon, and then quoted something. And then there was a link. And I, um, and I, first I thought he was just using the word lawfare. And, which is a term with an interesting history and a complicated one, uh, and particularly, particularly in certain political context, it, it has a, a particular political valence that the president could have been deploying. Then I realized, no, he was quoting lawfare. And then I realized, actually, he was quoting me. Um, and <laughs> it was a very strange day. It was about the travel ban, right? It was about the travel ban. And, and this was an article in which uh, I had described his motivations in issuing the travel ban as invidious and had said that I did not, did, I did not disagree with aspects of what the Ninth Circuit had done in enjoining it, but I had problems with the opinion. And he uh, uh, heard only the problems with the opinion. Let's put it that way. Bobby Chesney, I don't mean to be cheeky, but why do so many left of center people want to hear from national security lawyers like you right now. What is happening in so the country? One of the things that's so different about our 2015 onward atmosphere that it, has been much remarked upon is the extent to which people who I think traditionally would identify as the left uh, have found common cause and indeed uh, some degree of great appreciation, often, often expressed almost in heroic terms, uh, for the deep state, right, to borrow a phrase. And it, it's been very interesting for everybody involved to sort of get to know one another. Um, and I think what it reflects, and this is, uh, is kind of obvious, but um, in, at a time when there is, there's plenty of reason from the president's own words as a campaigner attacking the CIA in particular, but then in sort of systematically eroding, both from a policy perspective and a rhetorical perspective, the, the foundational elements uh, both at the high altitude and low altitude levels of the post-World War II free rule of law order that America has um, expended blood, sweat, treasure, and tears for for decades and decades. Um, 
naturally, it's the national security establishment, if there is such a thing. Me meaning over time, all the people who have been in the intelligence community, the military, law enforcement, uh, and diplomacy, all those entities um, are most likely to be the ones to resist this. And I'm not using resist with a hashtag. I mean, just in the ordinary sense of just you know being unwilling to go along with this very easily. Lawyers who are associated with those communities, and that has been identified. They're our original core audience, and it's a sensibility that our writings tended to speak to with a particular resonance. Um, the rule of law maintainers for the probably about who you would expect to be the people in a best position to interpret what's going on and to perhaps be the best advocates for explaining where you should be alarmed, where you don't need to be as alarmed, where, where the pushback ought to come from a legal and security perspective. And I think that's why so many people found Lawfare and the enterprise that we had already created by that point to be a real home for understanding what was happening and precisely what they might want to be upset about on that dimension. But Ben, this new audience has brought with it some tensions and discomforts. Sometimes these new people do not appreciate at all things that you have to say. You had an experience with this recently. Yeah, so let me, I mean, let me say, first of all, that I, that that's great. Um, you know, the, the purpose of Lawfare, Lawfare is not a political movement. It's not a, it's not a, it's not the hashtag resistance, right? It's not, it's a group of people who are interested in uh, analysis, the, the best analysis that we can provide of national security problems as seen through the lens of law. And uh, I think it is actually deeply moving that a whole lot of people instinctively understand and don't have to be explained to that the group of people that you would, and it, by the way, says a huge amount about the president, just like that's going to come off as a political statement, and I really don't mean it as one. I mean it as an objective analytical statement, that it says something about the president that very large numbers of people think that the people you would want to hear from in the analysis of the president's conduct are a group of people who came together to think about how to use law to confront external facing national security threats. And you know, th th that is itself an evocative uh, point. And so my, the, my first point is, look, I don't think you need to, I, I don't want only people who agree with me about all the things on which I have opinions, which are many, uh, to find what we're doing on lawfare valuable. I want anybody far left, moderate left, moderate right, far right, people whose politics who are off that spectrum entirely, like I think in some ways my own are, I want those all people who, who value the application of legal thought to national security problems to find the site useful. The first, the first, val the first importance of the site is to find, is to be useful useful to policymakers and increasingly useful to the general public as it sort of thinks about what's happening to itself. That said, there is a very large number of people who do not understand that the site is not political. There are people who do not understand that our goal is not to organize opposition, uh, that it's not to represent the deep state Right? Um, th though, by the way, I do consider part of my personal mission to represent the deep state. Uh, that, that, like, that's something that I, I actually think the institutions of the federal bureaucracy need an active defense. And I am something I am very personally committed to um, and spend a lot of time on. That's not lawfare's function. And, a lot of people, in, a, in exactly the way that five years ago people confused this sensibility with conservatism. Right now, people confuse this sensibility. And you know, Glenn Greenwald used to call me a handmaiden of power, um, which 
I embraced, but um, that you have uh, you have that quoted on the wall. I do. It's in fact hanging next to the Trump tweet. It's hanging on the wall of my office. <laughs> um, but I, just as people used to do that, people now confuse it with being part of the left. And I am not part of the left. Lawfare is not part of the left. Bobby isn't part of the left. Jack isn't part of the left. Like we, you know, there are people associated with the site who are very much part of the left. The site is not part of the left. And by the way. The fact that lots of people on the left agree with, find the site useful, does not mean we have to agree about all sorts of things that, that separate liberals and conservatives along the traditional left-right spectrum. Over the last few months, every time I personally have uh, expressed opinions that are not expected given that, uh, there has been a very harsh backlash, and that's you know been surprising to me because I I I I've been I frankly have not I don't know when the point was when I signed a contract to not have independent opinions about things. Okay, well one thing that's at the top of a lot of people's minds this week and has been all month is something that you all have actually not written about on the site. That's Brett Kavanaugh, the president's Supreme Court nominee. Why editorially are you not doing that at Lawfare? Well, so we have a fair amount of Kavanaugh content that is about some serious national security issues that will be implicit in the candidate's view or the nominee's views of executive power. And that, that's actually been a big part of what we've described previously as uh, Kavanaugh hearings 1.0. Years and years ago when that first set of hearings occurred, um, there was a lot of talk about executive power and Kavanaugh's views, on what might be his views on the special counsel, and both to some extent on the side, and especially in what is now increasingly a major part of it, which is our series of podcasts. Right? So the, the side is no longer just the, the written post. It's now the, the longer podcast series. Um, the National Security Law Podcast, which is me and Steve Vladek having a, it, that's car talk meets news hour, if you're wondering what that <laughs> is. Uh, and if, and if, you think, if, if you think I'm exaggerating, just listen to it. Um, we're not very mature people. Um, but on, on the podcast, we've had a lot of engagement with those issues. Uh, we've had written posts on the side about his uh, views based on his track record relating to Guantanamo and military commissions, relating to surveillance. Uh, 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 Technology and privacy Mueller issues. investigation related yeah, stuff. So, so if this guy is confirmed after all of this spectacle and mess, is he going to stand up to Donald Trump and protect Robert Mueller's investigation? So I, I, I mean, I have argued, and I stand by my argument to this effect, that people have gravely misread his limited set of writings on issues pertinent to the special counsel. And I think he's, I think they are much less threatening than other people think they are. That writing I did on Lawfare, because it's directly relevant to issues that, that, that Lawfare covers. There are a lot of people associated with Lawfare who have very strong feelings about the nomination in lots of different directions. And as a general matter, we don't cover judicial nominations per se. And so our editorial posture, both about this nomination and others, we took the same view about Merrick Garland. So both Brett Kavanaugh and Merrick Garland have extensive records in the national security field. Those conversations should, and we construe the national security field broadly, those conversations should take place on lawfare. More general conversations about the nomination, qua nomination, what kind of justice he would be, his views on contested social issues, none of that takes place on Lawfare. And all of us, including me, uh, have done our writing on the subject elsewhere. Well, I'll just say that uh, early on um, in the post-Trump period, I guess we're in the beginning of the, post the Trump period, we did get a lot of flack on other issues from people saying that it seems like the, you know, the blog has joined the resistance, the blog is doing this or that. And I wrote something, I guess it was in early 2016, and one of the only times I think I've ever written anything in all these years speaking for the founders, speaking institutionally, saying, we don't speak institutionally. We're a collection of individuals with different views that are all over the map. Um, and, and I think it says something about our information environment that a lot of people just find that a hard concept to process. 
that it's, a, that it's some kind of media informational enterprise that doesn't have a particular message it's trying to convey. It may sound, that may sound inconsistent with what I was saying about our sense that we have certain audiences in mind, but we don't take particular positions collectively. And we, and we certainly have never taken that with respect to you know, judicial nominations or any other nomination or other, other issues that are terribly important as matters of politics. And I want to be clear, let, none of this is to minimize the terrible importance of especially the latest round of things that are happening in the Kavanaugh nomination. Um, and at a certain level, you could say, well, but aren't those ultimately questions of security, you know, about honesty and the nominations and all? Well, yes, in the sense that all important things ultimately become issues of security, but that's really not, that's not how the, the institution looks at it. One more name out there, then I'm going to pivot. Um, Jim Comey. Ben, you have talked at length over the years about your friendship and admiration for Comey. Um, in some quarters, that's controversial. Some people might say you have a blind spot for Jim Comey. Do you? Um, I, I think my eyes are quite open about Jim. Um, so look, I mean, first of all, Jim is one of my writers. He's written for Lawfare, and you know, it's, it's always uh, editors don't denounce their writing. Oh, no, I'm, God. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm kidding. On. I just dropped um, my mic. Yeah. <laughs> That's a literal mic drop moment. Yeah. Um, <laughs> all right. Here's the real answer. Um, look, there are several different axes in which people are upset at Jim Comey. And uh, they're worth disaggregating. One is, um, that his handling of the Clinton email investigation. Um, now, those were positions, th th those decisions have been severely criticized. Uh, I think there is a little bit more to say for Jim's handling of them than the inspector general gave him credit for. That said, there are decisions Jim made that he knew were controversial when he made them, were going to be controversial. He's accountable for them. Uh, and I'm not going to say people shouldn't be upset at Jim about them. People should evaluate those, uh, uh, evaluate how he handled them and say what, say what they think. The second issue uh, is his interactions with the president. And this is really the area in which I have been involved. And I've been involved in it for the simple reason that I was in touch with Jim in this period, um, in the period leading up to the firings. We had a number of conversations that were uh, relevant to uh, the subsequent firing. And after the firing, uh, I called Mike Schmidt, who's here somewhere in, in, at the Texas Tribune Festival, and I detailed all those conversations on the record. And that is part of the uh, part of the uh, story about Jim Comey that came out, including you know the famous blue drapes incident, and you know uh, th th those are you know a function of the fact that Jim and I were in touch at the time. Um, I I think that uh, in if you are evaluating the the. If you were evaluating Jim on that axis, I think his conduct was exemplary. And I, if, if I am wrong about that, then yes, I have a blind spot, because I don't see it. I think, I, I think this was a set of incidents in which the president actively sought to interfere in the conduct of a major national security investigation the FBI director acted to in, ensure the integrity of federal law enforcement under extraordinarily difficult circumstances, and the president fired him for it. And I think it is worth disaggregating those two broad axes. One of them involves a set of things where Jim took very controversial positions, did it with his eyes open, and knowing that they were going to be controversial, and people can, should evaluate them however they feel. And, I, and there will, uh, I, you know, I think, I think the issue is complicated. A lot of people don't think the issue is complicated, and that's fine. Jim's a big boy in many ways. Um, and and <laughs> um, 
when you sit on a podium with him as a short person, it's really it's something. Um, the guy who works with Bobby Chesney. Well, <laughs> Bobby is tall, slashing. but he's a di but Jim not is a different eight. order. Not six tall. eight. Yeah. Um, like NBA tall. And you know, the other is really just an issue of the integrity of federal law enforcement, and it's much more a story about the president than it is a story about the FBI director. Yeah, I'll just add that uh, there's a sense in which lawfare seems like a, a journalistic enterprise from which you then expect certain maybe a, an ethic of distancing between the, the people generating the content and the subjects. Um, but we're not really. I mean, we're in that, that's what, lawfare is like a, an op-ed page run riot. It's a bunch of experts with opinions. And sometimes we get into the stories ourselves a little bit because of our expertise or our personal connections. Um, but we don't hold ourselves out as actually being separate from, from the things we're looking at. That's an important point. Bobby, I am old enough to remember and admire your listserv, which I am I sorry to it. see go. Um, you wrote on 9-11, on September 11th this year, a look back at this era in counterterrorism and a, a sense of how things had changed in the country and on the site. What did you mean to tell people for people who haven't read this yet? Well, you know, I got, I got into working in this field. I, I first became very engaged in this in the late 90s because I, because I cared a lot about terrorism and counterterrorism. That to me was the issue that mattered the most. Um, not that I felt it had to matter the most for everyone else, but it was what I had a passion for. There's something about the, the, the horrific injustice of people with political access to grind, uh, taking life and acting out in violent ways and harming random others that you know, just makes my blood boil, always has. And uh, when I became an academic around the time of 9-11 and devoted my career, the listserv, all my, all my teaching and everything else was ultimately about that. Um, and it seemed that the level of national attention and global attention tracked right along with my felt sense of the importance of the topic. Um, it was all there was to talk about, always in the headlines. When I teach national security law or counterterrorism law, you could count on walking into class every day, and I have some students here, and maybe some of you all have had this experience, and we'd, and we'd say, like, well, what was in the news today? And there was always something relevant and interesting about our topic. Um, and you know, that was never going to stay the case over time. And, and Lord knows we wouldn't want it to stay the case because staying the case with that level of attention would signify that that's still how prominent the counterterrorism issue was in terms of our national needs. If we were beginning to slowly succeed in tamping down the degree of threat, you never eliminate terrorism, but you, you want to tamp down the degree of threat as much as possible, like, like, like uh, any other public health problem you might, right? Um, then uh, gradually it would fade from the headlines. During the Obama years, once we'd been into this for you know, multiple presidential terms, um, there was a little bit of talk about what might it look to say that the war phase of the conflict with Al-Qaeda or the war on terrorism was over. And the very asking of that question proved to be uh, really galvanizing and upsetting people. Um, we couldn't stand to even talk about that under Obama. But under President Trump, because the Trump show takes up most of the oxygen in the room, because of the increasing obvious rise of near peer and eventual peer powers like China and the resurgence of, uh, of an angry Russia. And then the, the slate of issues that we sometimes call cyber, but the technology issues that are increasingly dominant. We have all these other things that now seem maybe slightly more important. And it's clear to me that on the inside, people such as you know, the team at the National Counterterrorism Center, they're still of course focused on terrorism, but our national dialogue quietly shifted elsewhere while we weren't really looking not many years after having almost objected to the idea that we could. But we're, is it possible maybe that this is actually what victory looks like? That we're just talking about other things and it doesn't dominate our minds? And so I pose the question, is this a sign of health? That it actually we did quietly, it took, it's like Nixon going to China. Trump actually got us to the place where we didn't have to obsess constantly over terrorism. Maybe we're doing well. Or is it taking our eye off the ball such that this will be the moment described in the first chapter of some future 9-11 commission report that time we look back and say, well, while we were all worried about the cybers and Trump's latest thing, we started under-resourcing and under-committing and, and harming alliance relationships that then had these trickle-down effects and something horrible happened. I don't know the answer to that, but I thought it was an important question to ask. Yeah, in fact, Nick Rasmussen, who ran the NCTC and is here, uh, said the other day that uh, his successors are going to have to fight a lot more for resources. That's right. There's a real... 
Look, I think the declining resources is sort of an inevitability. It couldn't be an, a, a climate of growing resources for all of our counterterrorism activities. The return of great power competition did mean, as Director Haspel said the other day, a need for CIA to, to reallocate some of its attention. Um, but there's also no question that the, the circus that is our national politics and, and the obvious harms to our alliance relationships, which are absolutely pivotal to effective counterterrorism, um, that's a real erosion we didn't have to have that's part of the current environment, and it scares me. Um, I don't have a lot to add to that. I, I do think it's a, uh, I, th I commend Bobby's 9-11 piece to everybody just as, as, a, as a really interesting set of reflections on this question. Um, I also do think, you know, one effect, I do think the effect that he's describing now, the, the sort of national circus atmosphere sucking the air out of the room is a profoundly dangerous thing. Uh, you know, the banner on Lawfare, uh, the slogan of the site is hard national security choices. I sometimes joke, I haven't thought about a hard national security choice in, in, a, in a couple years now. I, I, I deal with really stupid national security choices. Like, <laughs> how long should we exclude from the United States all children from Chad? But that's actually a conversation we had to have, right? It's, they're not excluded anymore, but they were for a while, right? And that's a conversation every minute that you spend thinking about keep, how, how long should we still keep the Chadian children out of the country? Every minute you spend thinking about that, that question is a, is a minute that you've lost to thinking about a question that's actually hard and actually important. And, you know, I don't think about national security legal questions anymore in the sense that we founded the site to do. I think about uh, the questions of how to, you know, w what laws can the president abuse, what laws can be deployed to restrain abuse. Uh, these are not the questions that I would want to be thinking about. And, and I do think th th Bobby's point is, is absolutely right as to Al Qaeda and terrorism, but it is actually right as to a broad range of other things as well. And we've actually had to have some deliberate uh, efforts to make sure, and, and I think I've, I've kind of played this role. <laughs> the um, deliberate, you're looking at the deliberate effort. I am the deliberate effort. <laughs> if, you, if you review our postings, you look at what I'm writing about, it's, it's blocking and tackling lawfare stuff. It's, it's what's in the new NDAA, it's the latest decision, and, and partly that just reflects my interest in where I think my narrow zone of expertise is, but partly it's an effort to make sure that we don't lose sight of our core mission and somehow become you know, yet another victim of the oxygen suck that is 2018. Okay, well, let me introduce one more oxygen suck question real quick, and then we're going to move to your questions. Ben, what is, you've, um, you've taken a confrontational approach to Vladimir Putin, repeatedly challenging him to provocations, fisticuffs, uh, <laughs> martial arts, Wait. and, and, and uh, mess with my premise later. But why, <laughs> why are you so much more confrontational, confrontational toward the leader of Russia than the leader of the country who was attacked by Russia in 2016? Uh, so first of all, I would never fight Trump because he's not trained. Um, <laughs> and so I think it would be unsporting. Um, I, <laughs> I, I do want to distinguish between what I challenged Putin to and fisticuffs. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I, mean, I, I, I challenged Putin to a mano a mano uh, and by the way, rules to, uh, to be negotiated. I, I'm really willing to meet him under almost any set of rules. No, uh, all jokes aside. Uh, all jokes aside, the fight, the, the fight idea was not a joke. Um, I meant it very seriously, and it was actually about uh, propaganda. Um, Putin has, and what, what caused me to do it was a video that RT posted on Twitter of Medvedev and Putin. This was back when, uh, I guess, Medvedev was, I, f I forget who was president and who was prime minister at the time. So do they. Me me <laughs> <laughs> they were working out together. And the whole point of the video was to show that you know, Putin as extremely manly compared to 
scrawny Medvedev, and uh, Mike McFall, our former ambassador in Moscow and somebody who's very sophisticated about Russia, tweeted this video with the note, Putin looks like he's in very good shape. And I was uh, really surprised by that because it, uh, this was obviously a propaganda video. And it suggested to me that this, uh, that it was a real reminder to me that propaganda works. And that if you bombard people over and over, even sophisticated people, even Russia expert people, with this, I, the Putin bare-chested riding on a horse, playing hockey, doing martial arts, um, the result would be that people actually start to buy it. And that th there's a reason why authoritarian countries make videos like that over and over and over again. And it's because they work. And so I very impulsively tweeted out, he's a phony martial artist, and I can take him any time. And that was the origins of the fight. I eventually wrote it up. It's actually an essay that I mean seriously um, and is really about the way Putin presents himself and the way people receive the presentation. Um, I describe myself in that article as a middle-aged desk worker who's moderately trained in martial arts. And I believe that I would take Putin easily in a fight. Um, and because I believe, having watched a lot of his videos, that there is actually a propaganda effort here, not a somebody who is serious in a contemporaneous sense, well-trained in fighting arts. Um, and I, my conditions for the fight are the following. I will meet Putin any time, any place. He lacks the authority to have me arrested <laughs> after he takes an independent drug test. And <laughs> I had to add the latter uh, criterion after, um, after uh, the movie uh, uh, came out last year about the Grigory Rachenkov case, um, which, by the way, if you have not seen, is, uh, Icarus is really spectacular and is about this propaganda. Um, and I, I, everybody jokes about it. Um, I mean it seriously. And for me, one of the proudest days in, uh, was when the Kremlin actually got asked about it. Um, and Dmitry Peskov was asked about my challenge to Putin and dismissed me as a, a, a fake journalist who they'd never heard of and said that um, uh, Vladimir Putin's martial arts skills were legendary. Um, and I feel like that part of my work on this planet is done. All right, we're gonna, we're gonna good, good, good ender. Um, we have time for your questions, about 15 minutes, so please raise your hands. We've got a person with a microphone in the back. Hi, um, I spent six years as a uh, cyber intelligence analyst working for the NSA and the Air Force. Um, and I used to say that I thought it would take a cyber 9-11 before we started really taking stuff seriously. Um, and I kind of thought that that had happened, uh, or close enough, uh, in the last you know, two years. And apparently, I was wrong. Um, so what do you guys think it will take uh, for policymakers to actually take the, 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 the issue seriously enough to invest the, the billions of dollars that are needed to harden our security? So I, th I think there are two uh, big issues woven in there. One is larger than cybersecurity or information security, and it's, it's really broader. It's information warfare, information operations, or the, the, the set of practices that sometimes involve the use of, uh, of hacking to, to get access to information, sometimes involves digital manipulation of information, but often involves things that are more familiar, non-technically dependent techniques to impact our information environment. And that's obviously the story of 2016, and we're still living through the aftermath of that. Um, and to an extent, that, wa that was an information operations Pearl Harbor to a substantial extent. That's a different set of issues and challenges, though interrelated, to the separate kind of purely technical question of how do we address pervasive inadequate security, especially in the critical infrastructure 
sector. And the, the fundamental problem there is a familiar one, but no, nonetheless hard to solve, and that's that so much of what we need to protect is in private sector hands, and we live in an environment in which the ability, the political will to directly regulate is limited for a host of reasons. Um, and, and the idea of what would you do if you could overcome that, and you had the political will in the aftermath of a Pearl Harbor type moment, what would we then do? Would we put DHS in charge of everything in a more direct way? Would we, would we actually have the nerve to just allow NSA to have direct access to all these private systems and police them? That, that would work. But we live in uh, sort of the post-Snowden moment as well, where there is the Snowden hangover, which is this catalyzation of concern about the government having too much access to, to information or private information and data. And so it, you know, one wonders, even if you had a, a, an actual takedown of a grid and some real consequences, would that even lead to change? So uh, I guess what I'm saying is uh, kind of a gloomy message of I think we're sort of doomed to have marginal improvements and hope that we're marginally, that we're staying ahead of uh, the bear that's chasing us, if you will. Just chose bear as a random an animal, no particular animal. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Thoughts? I, I'll just, just uh, quickly add to that that I, you know, one of the things that I admire about George W. Bush is that in the wake of 9-11, uh, he did not spend a great deal of time denying that 9-11 had happened. And, you know, we don't, we don't spend, uh, no one ever thought to praise him for that. Um, but I think in light of the 2016 election, where in fact, uh, it is an interesting little thought experiment to say, what if Bush's reaction to 9-11 had been to deny the premise that it had ever taken place? And I think the answer is, all the progress that we made in the counterterrorism space would not have taken place. Um, and if that sounds like a ridiculous premise, which it is, consider that that's exactly what's happening now. Next week, on Monday, we'll announce it. Okay, good. good, all, good. all profits from the t-shirts are going to go to ALS Texas. Okay, cool. And I'm disappointed that we're not going to see a kaboom here today. Um, so, whatever. Anyway. Well, so a couple, couple things about, about, about Baby Cannon. Um, number one, uh, we, I, I keep it separate from lawfare. Um, and number two, uh, Baby Cannon does not get along well with the Transportation Security Administration. <laughs> so, what's, what's that on your lapel you got there? Uh, got, I got my little Cannon pin here, but you know, I had a friend who once did a selfie with, with Baby Cannon and uh, then tried to go through a TSA checkpoint and had explosives residue all over her hands and face and spent, <laughs> spent a lot of time in secondary screening. And so, because try to explain that one. No, it was a small cannon. So we, the like small. baby cannon doesn't travel. <laughs> just, a, it's just a little cannon. Okay, okay, the real, the real question was, you didn't get there. I was hoping in response to that question, you'd talk about our actual capabilities. You talked about our defensive capabilities and what we can do defensively, but I always wonder, and but I have no way of knowing, maybe y'all do, maybe y'all don't either, uh, what are our offensive capabilities? Can we do the same things to them that we are so afraid of them doing to us? Could we take down their, could we take down their capabilities? Could we, could, do we have the capacity to do that? If our co-founder, Jack Goldsmith, was here, he'd be quick to say, as he's, I think, many times said, that one of the reasons why it's hard for the United States to take the position that certain things should be off limits, that we should promulgate international norms or, indeed, legal constraints to forbid them, is that there are a certain number of these things that are part of our arsenal as well, that we'd like to be able to do this for the pursuit of espionage, to advance uh, information goals through covert action abroad, uh, and in the event of war, to be to have prepared the battlefield appropriately and in the event of conflict to actually act, uh, which is not to say that therefore anything goes, but there's a substantial number of things that occur that we don't like and, and don't have to put up with, but that we don't necessarily want to delegitimize as having 
been sort of normatively inappropriate. So take the OPM hack, the infamous hack where it appears China got away with this vast amount of immensely useful information in a cyber-enabled espionage action. Um, Jim Clapper got in a lot of trouble in some quarters for, for basically saying, China, you know, hats off to you. That's a hell of an impressive intelligence operation. It's quite right. And I have no doubt that we have done comparable things. And, I, and if we haven't, I hope we're trying really hard to do comparable things. That doesn't mean that, therefore, you don't take a retaliatory action, that you don't impose costs and try to build deterrence. You have to be able to separate the idea of whether you're just going to take certain actions and whether you're going to actually affirmatively try to delegitimize them as something that we'd be hypocrites then if we did them. Those two are two different deals. Um, we've got a lot of capabilities. We're probably the best at this. But as Jack says, we may have the biggest rocks, but we also live in the biggest glass house. America is the biggest glass house in the block because of the nature of our free and open society, the, uh, the extent to which we're wired, et cetera. Um, and that's a hell of a position to be in. Hi, my name is Jamie Ailshire. I really appreciate you guys taking the time to be here today and to share your thoughts with us. Um, I'm having a little bit of trouble constructing this as a question, but my question is, can you comment on? Um, there's been a lot of discussion about um, continuing this lawfare uh, at home, resisting abuses of power uh, and different fronts like that that involve if due process is denied, particularly at the individual level, you see it in the immigration discussion and, and deportation discussions, um, how you wage lawfare when rights are denied to you. And I'm hoping that you guys would be willing to comment on that, um, particularly since in Texas it's a very big issue. Um, as native-born people of Hispanic descent are deported with no due process and things like that. Ben, I think this is a good segue to say something about, you mentioned earlier that Lawfare has a term of art meeting that's separate from being the name of our site, predates it. And that, I think that's right what, what James is getting at. Um, you want to comment on that? Yeah, so a couple, I'll, I'll, I'll bridge from, from your question directly to, to the, the more general point that Bobby raises. Um, Look, I think that uh, one of, you know, the more aggressive policy gets, uh, the more litigation it faces. And that's a general rule of thumb. Uh, you know, aggressive policy will tend to uh, raise more questions. Raised questions give opportunities for litigation. Um, and there is an energized bar that is uh, very committed to the set of issues that you're uh, alluding to. Um, at the same time, the denominator of people affected is very, very large. And so there is a danger in any such situation that, uh, that you do a lot of damage along the way before successful cases address the questions and, and clarify what you are and aren't allowed to do. Um, there's only one solution to this problem, which is more lawyers. And, you know, um, and, and that's the, you know, not a solution that a lot, of, and a lot of people who don't like lawyers, and I'm not a lawyer, to be clear, um, a lot of people who don't like lawyers don't like that as the answer, but when you're talking about very broad brush policies that affect a lot of people whose cases are highly individualized, each of those people needs representation, and that's, there's no substitute for that. Um, I love the way you used the term lawfare, because that was the original use of the term that we imagined when we started the site. So lawfare is a funny word, it's, um, it's, uh, it, and it is used historically. I think actually the site has now fundamentally changed the way most people understand what the word means. But when we chose the word, we meant it in exactly the way that you were describing, which is the you know, law over, about war and war over law and the use of law in war and the use of law in conflict. And we meant it just kind of as a descriptive. And, we were, um, and when we started the site, the first major controversy over the site, which was immediate and fierce, um, was whether the term was an offensive slur. And uh, a lot of people, including a bunch of people who now write for the site, 
um, um, and who were very close to the site, were deeply offended by our use of the term. Because in certain political contexts, particularly in, uh, particularly in, uh, in uh, the conservative world, but also, also in the Israeli context, interestingly, the, the word has this other meaning, which is the use of law and litigation by human rights groups to stymie counterterrorism efforts. And uh, people think of it as a pejorative term, and it is sometimes used as a pejorative term for human rights work. We never meant it that way. And I actually, at the time we started the site, kind of didn't know that it had that other uh, meaning. I knew uh, it. I was anxious when you were telling me what we might call it. I thought, <laughs> uh, we're going to catch some flack for that. But you argued at the time that, well, let's establish a clearer and, and more neutral meaning. And I'm, I think it's a real service that that's actually happened, in my opinion. So I, I think if I had known the controversy it was going to generate, we probably would have chosen it. Like, I, I, I didn't, li you know, um, we were originally going to call the, the site Fog of Law. And, uh, nah. and, and then, and then right, <laughs> when, right when we were about to launch it, uh, Jack found out that Michael Glennon had a book coming out yeah, called Fog right. of Law. And we, we got nervous that, that, that he would think we would stolen his name, which, uh, um, which we certainly hadn't. Um, and so we kind of just went to Lawfare as kind of a, it was like our backup plan. Um, I do think that one of the neat things that has happened over the life of the site is that the, the, the term has lost that pejorative meaning. And now people like you describe lawfare in a, you know, what, what kind of lawfare can we wage to help people who were, you know, who may be deported? And that's exactly the sense in which I would want the term used. And I, I kind of like that the site has, has, has reclaimed or claimed that term as a, as a respectable term in, in, in political and legal life. Thank you guys so much, both for the panel and for running a site like Lawfare for students. It's, it's honestly really, really helpful and a great resource. Um, something I'm interested in hearing about is kind of connecting two different policy issues that we've talked about, and that's counterterrorism and cybersecurity. So kind of looking at lessons learned from the global war on terror and the reorganization of the United States national security apparatus to address counterterrorism, where are we with that in cyber? And are, do we have the institutions in place to wage lawfare or to create lawfare? Um, and if not, what needs to be done in order to, to reorganize? It's, it's so tempting to try to get Nick and Josh in the back to come up here and join us and give more intelligent answers to these questions. But in lieu of that, I'll, I'll say this. Uh, if you ask about what was the institutional uh, consequence of 9-11 and the, the, the political will to action that created, Obviously, the creation of the National Counterterrorism Center, which Nick Rasmussen used to direct, um, and the establishment of the Department of Homeland Security and the realignment of some of its roles and functions, a host of other consequences, most dramatically perhaps the, the burgeoning of the special operations community and the realignment of the CIA uh, covert action arm towards kinetic operations. All these things are part and parcel of a larger strategy of taking a more, uh, much more kinetically focused and aggressive posture overseas to incapacitate one way or another um, people who, who mean to do harm to others. But a lot of the backbone of it is information. And as the NCTC especially uh, symbolized, you're not going to be any good at any of those tools that you've created if you don't know how to marshal and assess all this information in an environment that's awash in information. Um, Cybersecurity is not unlike that in the sense that, I, you could probably say this about any important government policy goal, in today's environment, if you can't amass and then make useful sense of the information, you're in a great deal of trouble. Um, suffice to say, without going in down to the details, we've seen a number of, of institutions created with, it, with a goal towards trying to improve the flow of information both within the executive branch, within the government, and then across that public-private divide I mentioned is so important earlier. I would say that one place where we clearly could be doing a lot better, though I don't think anyone has a, gr a really good idea about how to do it, is getting more flow from the public-private dimension. And that's a little different than the terrorism problem. There, there's an element of that with counterterrorism, but it wasn't, it wasn't so cross-public-private, whereas that's sort of the main thing, I would say, with cybersecurity. 
We're going to have to leave it there. Thank you so much, Bobby Chesney, Ben Wittes. Thank you, Carrie. The founders Thank of you. Lawfare. Thank you all.